important thing in many conditions, and especially in twins, is the first trimester. As you have already had a presentation on twins, you will realize that the moment that you define that you are dealing with a monochorionic or a dichorionic twin pregnancy, it's at 12 weeks. So this ultrasound at this period is completely important. Once you have classified the pregnancy as a monochorionic or dichorionic, you will decide the plan. And that's why this ultrasound, as you can see here in the slide, is the biggest one, 12 weeks, 12 semanas. Because if you are dealing with a dichorionic twin pregnancy, the next scan is going to be at 20 weeks. And then the next one at 28, and then the next one at 32, and then the next one at 36 weeks. But if you are dealing with a monochorionic twin pregnancy, the next scan is not going to be at 20. It's going to be at 16 weeks, and then at 18 or 20, 22 and 24. Why? Because the issue with monochorionic diamniotic twin pregnancies is that they are connected. They are connected through the placenta, and therefore, they are going to have complications that only are present, that are, that are only present in monochorionic pregnancies, and that usually kill the babies between the period of 16 and 26 weeks. That's, is the, that's the reason why it's so important to see these babies from 16 weeks on. Having understood that, we're gonna move into the next slide. We're gonna, uh, based all the information that I'm gonna give you in some papers published in very well impact journal, uh, pay, pay, journals, um, one of them is the one that we have published in the International Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology regarding the Doppler assessment in patients with twin to twin transfusion syndrome and selective IUGR. So, what is the, the first topic that we're going to talk about is the importance of chorionicity, the one that I have just already told you. So, chorionicity is important because we don't really care in ultrasound about the zygosity. We don't really care about it. What I really care is each baby has its own placenta or not. That's the only question I care. Of course, if you have a monochorionic twin pregnancy, you are dealing with a monozygotic twin pregnancy. Therefore, both are, are the same. The same gender, the same, the same phenotype, etc. If you are dealing with a dichorionic, dichorionic twin pregnancy, the majority of them are going to be dizygotic, so completely two different babies. But one third of them are going to be monozygotic, completely identical. That's why I'm telling you, and maybe that's the most important message regarding this chorionicity and zygosity and all this stuff, is what we do care in ultrasound, in fetal medicine is, do they share or don't they share the same placenta? That's the first question you need to answer when you face a twin pregnancy. And what is the reason of that? Because of the complications and the outcome that you're gonna have. Most of them related with loss of the pregnancy, miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm birth, major defects that are gonna be present in monochorionic pregnancies more frequent than in dichorionic pregnancies. Yeah. The two worst, the ones that kill both babies are TDTS, twin to twin transfusion syndrome, and selective IUGR. What is the problem with it, these two conditions? That most people, most professionals, and even most societies confuse the concepts of these two conditions. And if you manage to understand the difference between them, then you are going to achieve a big goal. Why? Because TDTS, twin to twin transfusion syndrome, is a condition related with blood flow, not with growth, but with blood flow. It's like a baby bleeding into the other baby through placental anastomosis. That's the definition of this condition. But then, when you have selective 
FGR, you are talking about growth. One baby is smaller than the other. And I'm telling you this because when I was doing my residency, they taught me, they taught me that TTTS was one big baby and the other a small baby, which is incorrect. And why I do so a big emphasis on this, because then the counseling that I'm going to do to the patient is going to change. When you have a TTTS, when you have a TTTS, you will have the opportunity to save both babies if you do fetal surgery. But if you do fetal surgery when you have selective FVR, it's not to save both babies. It's just to save or to protect the bigger baby from the imminent death of the smaller one. That's the difference. And that's why it's so important to identify because the parents need to know the possible outcome after the surgery. So then we go to the importance of the first trimester. The importance of the first trimester is not only related with the chronicity, but also with the early identification of signs, of ultrasound signs of TTTS or selective FGR. Why is it so important to understand the chronicity? Because as we have already said, besides the complications, you need to remember that because they are connected through the placenta, if one baby dies, the other half 15% to 20% of probability of dying, and 25 to 30% of probability of having neurological impairment due to a brain hemorrhage. So it's really important that if one baby dies in a monochronic pregnancy, the other can be severely affected. So in the first trimester, if we are, and I'm telling you this because I have had it, I have had these cases in Lima. If you have a monochronic twin pregnancy and you have one baby with a nuclear translucency of eight millimeters and you have the other baby with a nuclear translucency of 1.5 millimeters, please, don't think as your first possibility that one baby is having Down syndrome. Don't think like that because they are identical. Remember what I told you at the beginning, if they are monochorionic, they are identical twins. So if one baby has Down syndrome, the other will have it. But if you are in the first trimester and you have one baby with eight millimeters of nuclear translucency and the other with 1.2, it means that you are facing a severe TTTS. So, that's important to acknowledge in the first trimester regarding TTTS. And regarding selective IUGR, you need to remember that if you are, if they are identical, they should grow identical. So if you have one baby with 65 millimeters and the other with 52 millimeters, so a discordance of more than 10 millimeters, it's for sure that they have a discrepancy in the distribution of the placenta. So one baby has the biggest part of the placenta and the other has a smaller one. How do you demonstrate that? Something that maybe you cannot do in the second trimester. That's what I say it seems is so important, the first trimester is scan. Because in every monochorionic twin pregnancy, you, are, you, should, you should localize or identify the umbilical cord insertion of each baby. And usually, when you have a big discrepancy in CRL in the first trimester, it's because the insertion of the umbilical cord of the biggest babies is in the center, it's in the middle. While the insertion of the umbilical cord of the smaller baby is marginal or velamentous. So that's an early identification of a future severe selective IUGR. And then we go with the ISWOC guidelines. In ISWOC guidelines, it's basically what I have told you at the beginning. If you have a dichorionic twin pregnancy, you will check the babies at 12 weeks, 20 weeks, 28, 32, and 34. But if you have a monochorionic diamiotic twin pregnancy, you will check it at 12, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. Why? Because between 16 and 26 weeks, is the window when these complications called TTTS and selective IUGR can kill the babies. Having understood that, we're gonna move into the next part, which is the difference between TTTS and selective IUGR. There is a journal that in, in Germany that was mentioning these TTTS like 
tops, which is twin oligoamnios polydramios sequence, because there are some pregnancies that do not qualify as TTTS, but they do have a discrepancy in amniotic fluid. So that's why they prefer to use the term TOPS. Any, anyway, the real problem here is to understand the physiopathology behind each condition, each ultrasound condition. Because if we understand what is happening in real life, then we will understand the ultrasound signs and the management that we're gonna to do to each of, the, of these patients. So if we have a problem of blood flow, we're gonna have either TTTS or TAPS, twin anemia polycythemia sequence. Remember, these babies are connected because they are sharing the same placenta through placental anastomosis. So if one baby is having more blood flow than the other, it means that the baby, which is the recipient, will at some point develop cardiac insufficiency. And how do you manifest cardiac insufficiency? By peeing a lot. You do a lot of pee. That's why you will have polyhydramnios, polyhydramnios. Your heart will get bigger and therefore your ductus venosus is going to be affected. It's going to be affected. That's why in TTTS in the recipient, you check for the Doppler according to the twin. In recipients, I check the ductus venosus, and in the donor, I check the umbilical cord that we're gonna talk later. When you have a placental asymmetry in the distribution, you talk about selective FGR, selective IUGR. And if there is any malformation with one of the twins, we talk about the trap sequence, twin reverse arterial perfusion sequence. There is a problem here. The problem here is that TTTS is an acute condition. It's an acute condition. Selective FGR is a chronic condition because you have selective FGR since the very moment these babies divide. Since the very moment they divided, you have the problem because one baby got more placenta than the other. TTTS, on the other hand, is an acute problem. They are completely normal. And then suddenly, there is a problem in the connections in the placenta. And then one baby starts to receive more blood flow and the other starts to give more blood flow to the other baby. So the problem with this is that some cases of selective FGR can be complicated by TTTS, by TTTS. That's why it is important to identify each condition because the prognosis is gonna change. So what is happening in TTTS? What is happening in TTTS, as you see in the video, is that one baby is receiving more blood flow through the placental anastomosis, therefore, is gonna get cardiac insufficiency. The bladder is gonna be bigger because it has a lot of blood flow. It's a hyperdynamic baby, and the amniotic fluid is gonna be increased. While the other baby, because doesn't have blood flow, and then the kidneys do not receive blood supply, the bladder is gonna be empty, absent. Not because there is no bladder, but because there is no urine. And therefore, the amniotic fluid is going to disappear because the amniotic fluid is the urine of the baby. And that's why you are going to have a stuck twin, which is the donor, and a recipient twin, which is going to be very big. Okay? And then we move into how do you use ultrasound to identify these conditions. If you have a discrepancy in amniotic fluid, you have TTTS. If the deepest vertical pool is more than eight centimeters before 20 weeks or more than 10 centimeters after 20 weeks and the other baby or, sorry, or the other baby has amniotic fluid less than two centimeters, then you have TTTS. So remember, the summary of this slide is TTTS is equal to amniotic fluid. Perfect. Then you have discrepancies. If you have a discrepancy in the estimated fetal growth of more than 
and the estimated fetal growth of the smaller one is less than the 10th centile, then you are facing a selective IUGR. So in summary, selective IUGR is synonym of growth, abdominal circumference. And then you check the MCA, the middle cerebral artery. And if the middle cerebral artery, one baby has the peak systolic velocity, more than 1.5 moms, which is usually the trick here, if you don't have the chart of the values next to you, is that if one baby has the peak systolic velocity more than the double of the gestational age, so if the gestational age is 22 weeks and the peak systolic velocity is 56 centimeters per second, then this baby is severely anemic. Even if you don't have the chart next to you, because you know that is more than the double of the gestational age. And if the other baby has the velocity very low, less than 0.8 mom, then you will have taps, okay, taps. And how do placentas look like? In a placenta with, in a placenta with TTTS, you will see that there are at least six or eight anastomoses between the two umbilical cords, okay? In the selective FGR, you will see that one umbilical cord, the umbilical cord of the bigger baby, is going to be in the middle, while the umbilical cord of the small baby is going to be marginal. That's how placentas look like. The other thing that you will see in a TTTS placenta is that one side of the placenta is going to be very, very dark because it's full of blood, while the other is going to be very pallid, pallida, le decimos en español, very clear, very pallid, lack of color, because of course, there is not blood flow going through this baby. So, again, summary regarding ultrasound. If you are thinking of TTTS, the deepest vertical pool is gonna be more than eight centimeters when it's less than 20 weeks, and more than 10 centimeters when it's more than 20 weeks. And the deepest vertical pool, always less than two centimeters in the donor. In selective FGR, there is a discordance in the weight of the baby of more than 25%, and the small baby should be less than the 10th centile. So then we go to TTTS and uh, selective IUGR in these babies. Look, this is a combination, selective IUGR plus TTTS. So you have a small placenta, and besides, one placenta is completely darker than the other because of blood flow. So regarding this publication that we did in, in this journal, in the Journal of the Figo, we realize that when there is only twin to twin transfusion syndrome, the outcome after surgery is very good. We save both babies. But when you have selective IUGR and then twin to twin transfusion syndrome, our outcome of both babies alive is very poor. It's very poor because of the reason I have told you before. When you do the surgery, you divide the placenta. You split the placenta. So what, in fact, you are doing is leaving the small baby with a small portion of the placenta with no possibility of having maybe a little bit of food from the other baby. So you are doing the, 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 the surgery here because you want to protect, you want to protect the big baby from the death of the small one. So how do we classify by ultrasound the TTTS? You have the first stage, which is only a discrepancy in amniotic fluid, oligohydramnios, oligohydramnios. Then you have the second stage, which is the absent, the absence or presence of the bladder. Then you have the Doppler, the Doppler. So here is important, as I always tell my fellows, not to be robots. Not to be robots, but to think. If you want to think about the Dopplers, what you really care about the recipient is about the ductus venosus. And what you really care about the donor is the umbilical artery. Why? Because the affection, the, the abnormal ductus venosus in the recipient is the consequence of cardiac insufficiency due to a hyperdynamic status of the baby because of the blood flow that he or she is receiving. While in the donor, the abnormality in the umbilical artery 
is because of the small or a small blood flow that the baby is receiving, and therefore uh, the obstruction that the placenta is uh, putting to the umbilical artery. So that's why donor umbilical artery recipient ductus venosi. So that's what we really care about Dopplers in twin to twin transfusion syndrome. The fourth stage is when one of the babies is having high drops, and the fifth stage is when one of the babies has died. And that's why I put this in purple, because this is going to be like a, my, my main decision or my main a, a sign or finding that is going to help me to decide when to do the surgery, the fetal surgery, or not. Okay? So if you have uh, an, uh, an abnormal Doppler and TTTS, you need to do the surgery. Always. Always. And then we have other classifications when I was in Cincinnati, USA, that we used to implement, uh, especially when you analyze the cardiac parameters, in this case, the MPI, the Myocardial Performance Index, in the recipient twin. Because as I told you before, this recipient, which is the more, the more affected twin in TTTS, has this cardiac insufficiency that once the condition is uh, operated by, by laser surgery, is the one that is going to take more time to recover because the heart has been damaged. That's why it's important to check the, uh, the, the heart of all recipients. And then, regarding the Doppler, as I told you before, in the donor, we're going to check the umbilical cord, as you see here in the pictures. And when you have an absent or reversed EDF in the endosolic flow in the umbilical cord, then you catalog or you name this baby as an abnormal. And with the ductus venosus, the same. If you have an absent a, a wave or reversed a wave, then you are facing an abnormal ductus venosus. So these five states are not sequential. So maybe you can have only today a discrepancy in amniotic fluids. One baby is stuck with absent Doppler, and then the next week the baby's died. The baby has died. So. That's why it's important to make a decision when to do the surgery before babies die. Because remember, if one baby die, the other baby is going to be affected if you have not divided the placenta. And as I told you before, Cincinnati also implement these, uh, condition, these uh, other stages between three and four that uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter a lot if you are going to make a decision of doing the surgery or not but mainly they are related between the early TTTS and the end stage TTTS regarding the heart, the heart of the recipient. So what is the real question here? The real question that we do a lot in the world and also, of course, in my country is if you have a TTTS stage three, you will do the surgery for sure. But what happens if you have a TTTS stage one? So the outcome that has been published by the North American Fetal Therapy Network is that 60%, 60% of TTTS stage one that was managed expectantly, 60% progressed, 60% progressed. While only, as you can see here, 20% disappeared, became normal, and 8% keep in the stage one. So you can say that nothing happened. And then 10% had preterm birth. 10% had preterm birth. So what is the summary of this slide? The summary of this slide is that 30% of a stage one TTTS do not really need it or need surgery. But 70% of these TTTS stage one had bad outcome because 60% progressed and 10% delivered early. So my recommendation is that when you have TTTS stage one, you need to follow them every week and you need to be ready. You need to be ready to do the surgery as soon as you see any 
complication or progression or abnormality in Douglas. You need to keep an eye on them because the majority of them complicate. TTTS is an ugly condition because it's very fast. And if you do not, if you do, not do the surgery quickly, you can have a bad outcome. How do you do this surgery? So the purpose of this surgery is to divide the placenta, to burn these placental anastomosis that usually are six or eight of them. So if you have, if you have the equator of the placenta, then you will have done the job. So therefore, the most difficult part, as Juliana knows and as Emily knows, as we have learned there with Professor Nicolares, is not regarding the surgery, it's not the performance of the surgery itself. The most difficult part is identifying the exact point through which I should enter the womb of the patient. That's the most difficult part. Where should I enter the placenta? Where should I enter the womb? Where should I enter the uterus? So to do this, we need to identify the insertion of both umbilical cords. We need to identify the donor, and we need to identify the point in which by entering with the fetoscope, we're gonna go completely perpendicular to this membrane. Because if we go perpendicular through this membrane, we're gonna be able to burn all the placental anastomosis. So when you go into fetoscopy and you see the membrane, then it means that you are getting it right because the membrane is gonna be the first guidance that you're gonna have once you are inside. It's easy to speak when you are in a presentation like this, but when you are inside the womb, believe me that you need to have landmarks to guide you because otherwise you're gonna get lost. But what is what really give me or give confidence to anyone that performs this kind of surgeries is knowing how to do ultrasound. Because if at any time you get lost inside doing fetoscopy, you grab your probe, your ultrasound probe, and you do the ultrasound. And then you will realize where you are, what is your fetoscope, um, in which direction that the fetoscope is pointing to. So by doing this, you will identify the amniotic membrane and you will identify the vessels that are crossing the membrane and that are joining to the, mem to the vessels coming from the other umbilical cord. We have presented the work in, in, in the ultrasound in obstetrics and gynecology journal in which we have reported abnormal anastomosis from different, uh, from different types. Remember that I don't wanna go deeper in this, but there are different types of anastomosis, arterio, arterial venous anastomosis, um, arterio arterial anastomosis, venous venous anastomosis that are even more complicated to analyze when you are doing fetoscopy. So then, we go to the performance of this surgery. So in a diagram, you, you will identify the donor, you will identify the insertion of the umbilical core, you will identify the amniotic membrane, and then you need to identify the vessels. But once you identify the vessels, once you identify the vessels, the next point, as you can see in this video, is to start burning them. We do this with a laser, Usually it can be neodymium jack or it can be the old laser. And the first thing that we need to do is to burn one of them. And then when you burn one of them, then you go into the next one. You go into the next one. And then you go into the next one. And then at the end of burning, as you see here in this video, the placental anastomosis, then you will join them. Because by doing this, we avoid this complication called TAPS. TAPS that I mentioned before stand for twin anemia polycythemia sequence. In 95% of cases, is because of an incomplete, incomplete laser surgery. And it can happen to anyone, it has happened to me, it has happened to anyone that has done this job at some point. So there are some vessels that are very difficult to burn. So you burn them, but then you need to double check it because then they refill. So they are very tricky. So that's why 
you need to always double check the burning of all your vessels if you don't want to have your, baby, your pregnancy to develop taps. What we used to do in London, so this is the old, as, as your left, you see the old uh, Harris Birth right, Research Center, Center because nowadays everything is in the fetal medicine center. And in that same room with Julia, when Juliana did these lasers, I did the same lasers. And you have professor then guiding us. And you see how we, in the right, we are burning one of the vessels. We get close. And if you get too close, as you see the hand of professor then pointing out to me, you will start burning the placenta. So you don't want to do that because otherwise you will have a bleeding, a placental bleeding. But once you mark the anastomosis, once you burn the uh, one anastomosis, then you go to the next one. And then when you go into the next one, you burn it, and then you will join it with the previous one. So you start to mark your line. And that's how you cure TTTS. And at the same time, you avoid having taps. So then that, as you see there in the video, that's the next one. That's the next anastomosis, okay? And we burn it, as you can see in the video. So we have burned the first anastomosis. This is my second anastomosis. And then the next thing that I'm gonna do is start to burn, connecting, start to burn the placenta, connecting both anastomosis. And then I'm going to move into the third one and into the fourth one. So I can have, I can have the six or eight placental anastomosis completely cured. Very good. How do we do here in Peru? You have seen how we do in London with professor, but here in Peru, we do it always in the surgery room, in the surgical room with the ultrasound next to us, with uh, equipment of not only uh, MFMs, but also the anesthesiologist, which is giving us the epidural and, uh, uh, anesthesia to the mother. Uh, and then, as I, uh, as I told you before, and as I have shown you, once we enter, we need to identify the umbilical cords. And then we identify the umbilical cords, we're gonna go to see the, uh, you see here's the, the insertion. I see here the umbilical cord, and once you see the umbilical cord, you start to follow the vessels, as you can see here that I'm doing. I start following the vessels until they are gonna join in the membrane with the next, um, with the next vessel, with the vessels from the other baby. So that's why, that's why it's important to know where to enter. So here you have the stuck twin, and as you can see, the amniotic membrane is completely folded over it. Completely folded. You see? And the other baby, the recipient, is there next to him. So this baby is not moving at all, has no amniotic fluid, and as you can clearly see, the amniotic membrane is completely folded over this baby. While this is the recipient, Usually, in TTTS, recipients are very active because they are very annoyed by the excess of blood flow in its body. And then, as you can see there, we have shown you already there how we do it in, in the surgery, we have the results. So in triplets, is the same story. In triplets, is the same story. In triplets, we can have selective IUGR, especially when we're talking about dichorionic triamniotic triplets dichorionic diamnetic triplets. And the uh, same thing happens with monochorionic triamniotic triplets when it's a little bit trickier to do the surgery because you will have to find two equators. In any of the cases, as you will see in the conclusions, TTTS has best, better outcomes than selective IUGR. So conclusions. Regarding the conclusions you can see in this, in this video made by the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, when we do selective laser, when we do the laser for these placentas that have this connection, we're gonna enter, we're gonna identify one recipient, one donor, the stuck twin, 
is going to have absent bladder. The recipient is going to have a big bladder. And then in the placenta, we're going to identify the connections. We're going to identify the connections. Don't forget that in phytoscopy, when you see the arterial branch, it's going to be dark. Dark. Because it's the non-oxygenated blood from the baby. While the venous part is going to be bright red because it's the oxygenated blood coming from the mother. So we use the fetoscope and then through the fetoscope we're going to put the laser fiber and through the laser fiber we're going to start burning these vessels. We're going to use a, a 40, 30 to 40 units of intensity to do this burning. When you see a green light, the majority of the times is a diode, diode laser. When you see a red light, the majority of the times is neodymium jack. There is no such a big difference between them. The only thing is that they need to be continuous, continuous lasers. You can, you can do a proper burning of the vessels and also the equator. What is that take home message? The take home message is that in twins with TDTS, the overall survival is 60 to 80 percent, but in selective IUGR, it's only 50 percent. And in triplets, it's the same. If you have TTTS, it's 70 percent, and in selective IUGR, it's 50 percent, except when you talk about monochorionic triamuric triplets when the survival is very low, but that's mainly because of the uh, preterm birth rate of these uh, triplet pregnancies. The survival that we have in our series that I have just published in the Peruvian Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology regarding our 35 cases that we have done so far is that when we have at least one survivor is more than 80%. I can say that usually always we save one baby. If we have only 10% of no survivors, that is, in fact, it's only just a couple of cases that both of them died, but it's mainly because you have the referral of these cases with a too advanced condition. And that's the other thing. If you do the control of these cases, as I told you before, from 16 weeks on, you will have an early identification of the complications. But if you don't do that and you do a normal anatomy scan at 22 weeks, maybe it's going to be late. It's going to be too late. And then you, you won't have the opportunity to save them, even if you do the laser surgery. So that's why it is important to do an early identification of these complications. And well, this is the final slide. This is my song with Professor Nicolaides in London from the last year. No, that was two years ago when we were able still to fly it across the world. So if you have any question, please do not hesitate to ask me. Uh, Julie, I cannot hear you, Julie. Yes, now, now. <laughs> I don't know, I can hear you, I can hear you. Thank you so much. It's an amazing Perfect. lecture. I'm very happy to see you and I'm so proud to see the work you've been done in your country. Thank it's you. amazing you, because I think that more than anyone in the world, I know how yes. difficult it is to implement this kind of it service. Is, is, I know how is. difficult it is to create a flow of twin pregnancies to your yeah. service and yeah. be able to get these complications right in the beginning or even to receive the complications later on in pregnancy. So yeah. 